Okay. Uh, well, first of all, let me thank Rachel uh, and, and Kirsten and Eric for the invitation. Thank you, Rachel, for the lovely introduction. Can I check? Can everybody hear me okay? And, and standing here, you can see the screen all right? And, and online, somebody can give me the thumbs up. Is everything okay there for you as well? Okay, I see a thumbs up. Um, I want to begin by saying what a thrill it is for me, two times over, to be giving this lecture as a guest of the Leeds Philosophical and Literary Society. Uh, first of all, because the Leeds Phil and Lit, as, as we call it, uh, is so fab. Uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the, the genre, Lit and Phil's, as they're known almost everywhere else, uh, but these organizations sprouted up uh, across provincial Britain in the late 18th century and the early 19th century to do exactly what we're gathered for this evening, uh, to, to bring citizens together to discuss serious ideas in science and the arts. It was a great thing to do in the late 18th century and early 19th century. It's still a great thing to do. And, and uh, the particular society here in Leeds has been continuously in operation from uh, 1819, as I recall. So over 200 years of service. Uh, it's the more uh, delight to, uh, to once again be, be involved with them. They've been very supportive of history and philosophy of science at Leeds. We all benefit from the museum collections that they gathered in the Leeds City Museum. I could go on. So that's one reason why I'm thrilled to be here. The other is that the book that I'm here to talk with you about tonight is where I make my own debut as a writer of philosophical fiction. Uh, that debut, uh, there's the, 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 the cover of the book. Uh, that debut takes place at the very end uh, of the book in the, the third of three postscripts that round things off. And in that postscript, what I offer readers is an extract from a counterfactual edition of the Dictionary of Scientific Biography Counterfactual meaning it belongs to an alternative history, a history in my case, in which the battle over Mendel, which my book is about, went differently than it actually went. What if the losing side in that battle, and in particular the, the leading figure on the losing side, a man called Weldon, had not died as he, as he did in 1906, but lived long enough to publish the book that he had almost finished at that moment. What would history have been like? What would the history of science have been like? Uh, I give you my answer at the end of the book in this extract. Uh, and to anticipate a little bit, one of the views that I defend about what genetics would be like now is that the biotech wonders that we're all familiar with, and we'll each have our favorite example. Uh, one of my favorite examples, which I use in the book, is the spider goats of Utah. So we're looking at here uh, at uh, a goat which thanks to transgenic wizardry, produces spider silk in its milk. A, a gene from a spider was transplanted into a goat egg and generations after generations of goats in Utah produce spider silk in their milk. That's the kind of world that we live in, the world of molecular biology and all of its successors. Molecular biology, as some of you will know, a term which first began to be used here in Leeds in the 1930s. In my view, whichever side had won, in the battle over Mendel in the early 20th century, we would now have spider goats and CRISPR and pretty much all of the biotech wonders that we're familiar with. So what would be different? I think one of the big things that would be different is that we wouldn't be confronted with the relentless and misleading and pernicious hyping of genes as invisible string pullers determining how our lives go and our bodies grow. You can't but open up your laptop without finding some news story or other telling you that this, that, or the other is determined by your genes. Most recently, we got vegetarianism maybe in the gene study files. You read on and what you find is that what they actually found was that there are some people with variant enzymes, which perhaps make it easier for them to metabolize vegetables a little better than other people. But that's not how it's promoted. Vegetarianism may be in the genes. You turn for relief to the BBC and you find a program which is on now called The Gift, all about what happens when uh, one 
person gives another the a DNA ancestry test as a present and all kinds of revelations unfold. Now you might think that that would be an interesting kind of a test to take because it would be interesting to know what DNA variants you carry in your genome and what light that throws on your ancestry. Uh, but here what you find in the, find, uh, in, in the, the, the text underneath the, the heading is that this is for people who've ever wanted to find out who they really are. Now, if that question even makes any sense at all, it certainly doesn't make the sense to say that the way to find that out is to find out what gene variants you carry, but you wouldn't guess that from the way all of this is promoted. My book argues that the battle over Mendel in the early 20th century is a kind of sliding doors moment for biology. It's a hinge moment, a pivot moment. In a little more detail, it argues that the Mendelite of the science of inheritance in the early 20th century, by which I mean its reorganization around the patterns that Mendel found in crossbred peas, and around the gene concept explaining those patterns was not inevitable. It was not a foregone conclusion that those patterns and those concepts would be at the center of our thinking about inheritance. Rather, it was an accident of history and one which in the early 21st century is overdue for correction. Uh, there was a very friendly review of the book that appeared over the summer in The New Scientist, which described the book as pressing the reset button on genetics uh, and as showing how history can be a guide to how to do that. Uh, and I, I like that characterization very much. So it's a book in three parts. Uh, the first part called Before basically sets the scene, all the background that you need in order to understand the battle, uh, which is what the, the middle part of the book is about, in which I plunge the reader into the blow by blow of this ferocious debate over Mendel's paper on pea hybrids and whether it should or shouldn't become the centerpiece for our thinking about inheritance, really biology. The book then uh, has a final section called Beyond, in which I stand back from the details of the debate that I've just reconstructed and interrogate its significance. Why did this matter? Why did things turn out the way they did? What else might have been? Uh, and so I, I can't give you the, the whole of the book in, in the, the short time I have available, but I wanna give you a little flavor of each of the three parts. I'm gonna begin by talking about Mendel himself and why in my view, uh, Mendel's awesomeness, and he was awesome, but Mendel's awesomeness has nothing to do with his status as founder of genetics. I'm then gonna turn from there, tracking now the middle part of the book, to look at what was at stake in the post-1900 battle over Mendel, which for my purposes, uh, certainly tonight, but also largely in the book, uh, means the debate between the chief Mendelian, man called William Bateson, based at Cambridge, and his most implacable critic, a man called Walter Frank Raphael Weldon, Raphael to his friends, based at Oxford. We're gonna look at what it was exactly that particularly Weldon thought was at stake in getting this question right. I'm going to turn at the, uh, towards the end of the lecture to, to how asking about an alternative Weldonian text for genetics has opened up options for resetting genetics in the present and the future. So that's where we're going. Let's start with Mendel, Mendel's awesomeness. And has there ever been a more appealing scientific hero? Who doesn't like? to hear about Gregor Mendel in the garden at the monastery there in Brun as it was then, Brno as it is today in the, in the Czech Republic, crossing his peas, immense labor over a long period. Uh, our fondness of Mendel even extends to some good jokes. Uh, what did Gregor Mendel say when he founded genetics? What do you think? Good. Not right, but good. Mind your P's and Q's is one suggestion. What else might he have said? All these PhDs. All right. Uh, whoopee. Now, some of you don't need any coaching at all in the Mendelian basics, but for some of you, it may have been some while. 
since we thought about it. So I thought we might go through the very elementary bit of elementary uh, Mendelism together. So there Mendel is with his crossbred, with his, with his P varieties, and he spends a long time purifying his starting varieties, making sure that his yellow seeded varieties only ever produce yellow seeded progeny. They are in, in the jargon true breeding. And his green seeded P varieties only ever produce green seeded progeny. Again, they're, they're true breeding for that character. Only when he's satisfied himself that he has purified his breeds to the nth degree does he then cross them. And what he finds is that when you cross a yellow seeded P with a green seeded P, all of the offspring peas are yellow. When you grow the pea plants from those seeds and they produce seeds, the green character comes back in a ratio of three yellow seeds to one green seed. This is one of the many discoveries Mendel made, this pattern right, that we get all of the one character in the hybrid generation and the return of the vanished character in the next generation. Mendel calls the character which is visible in the hybrid generation the dominant character, what we still call it. And dominant just means it's the one you see in the hybrid generation. The other character, the one that recedes but comes back, he calls the recessive character. So yellowness is dominant, greenness is recessive. That's impressive, but it's just a start because Mendel goes on from there to explain this pattern with enormous agility. Mendel says, let's suppose that in the yellow seeded pea plants, there's nothing when it comes to yellowness of the seed, but yellow making factor. And likewise in the green seeded pea plants, when it comes to greenness, there's nothing but green making factor. Now, what happens when those plants are crossed? In that case, a -mac, a -make, uh, or yellow making factor comes together with green making factor, but yellowness is dominant, right? And so all that's visible is the yellowness part. Now, what happens when those hybrid plants themselves form gametes, form pollen and egg cells? Mendel says on his hypothesis, it's not the case that the hybrid plants produce hybrid gametes. Right? It's not the case that the gametes are yellowy greeny. Rather, Mendel says, let's suppose that each gamete is either all yellow or all green, pure for one or, or the other of the parental characters. And, and let's make a few further assumptions that it's entirely a matter of, of chance, which gamete meets which gamete uh, when uh, self-fertilization happens. And what Mendel shows you is that on these simple assumptions, the pattern that he discovered becomes beautifully intelligible. Right? Because there are four possibilities. What are they? Well, yellow making factor can meet with yellow making factor, in which case you get a yellow seeded pea. Yellow making factor can meet with green making factor. Yellow beats green, you get a yellow pea. Green making factor meets with yellow making factor. Again, yellow beats green, you get a yellow pea. Only in the one case, the one out of four, when green making factor meets green making factor, do you get a green seeded pea. Your three to one ratio beautifully explained. And as I say in the book, if you like science at all, a little cork will pop in, a, in the bottle in your mind. You'll think, wow, how clever, how clever on nature's part, how clever on Mendel's part to have figured that out. And, and this is, as I say, step one in, in a truly extraordinary paper that deserves its classic status. But then the historians come along and they spoil everything. Because what I've just given you is how we meet the paper in our textbooks, in our classrooms. But what actually is Mendel's paper itself concerned with? If you go back and try to read it, in the spirit in which Mendel wrote it, the spirit in which he was read by his contemporaries there in the mid 1860s. The key the historians say is his title, Versuche über Pflanzenhybriden, Experiments on Plant Hybrids, not heredity. The German term for heredity comes up only once in Mendel's paper in passing. 
It's of no consequence at all. Mendel's paper is about what he says it's about. It's about plant hybrids. And his way of thinking about it is so alien to us that I need to spend just a little time introducing you to this conception. So we're going to take plant hybrids as a term seriously. Mendel distinguishes between two kinds of hybrids. He says, first of all, there are the constant hybrids. So let's say you're a breeder. Right, and so you're interested to see what happens when you uh, cross plant A, plant with interesting character A, and plant with interesting character B. You cross them and you get plant with interesting character C. Now you're excited because if you can keep C breeding constantly down the generations, you could make a lot of money. So you cross your fingers, let the plant self-fertilize, and you're in luck. It stays constant down the generations. Mendel says, this is not what my paper is about. My paper is about the other class of hybrids, what he calls the variable hybrids, right? So now we take plant with interesting character A, plant with interesting character B, we cross them together, we get plant with interesting new character C, we cross our fingers, and it doesn't work out. The old character returns. Mendel says, this is what my paper is about about the variable hybrids. Mendel's question is whether there is a law that governs the fate of the hybrid character in variable hybrids. And if there is a law, can he explain that? And boy, does he do that. But that's Mendel's problem as he understands it and as historians, I think, have correctly reconstructed it. And there's an interesting empirical test that we can make of this interpretation of what Mendel was up to. And that's to do with the copy that Mendel owned and annotated of the German translation of Charles Darwin's Origin of Species. Darwin never read Mendel, but Mendel read Darwin and made notes in his copy. Now, in the first chapter of The Origin of Species, Darwin has a superb discussion of inheritance under that title. How many annotations do you think Mendel made? Zero. Almost all of Mendel's annotations in his copy of The Origin of Species are in a chapter that almost no one reads nowadays, the chapter on hybrids. Mendel was interested in hybrids and he read Darwin's book opportunistically through the lens of his own interests. Likewise, when we carry on in the spirit, trying to read Mendel's paper without the anachronism, the backward projecting that our textbooks encourage, we find likewise that in the text, there's no evidence that Mendel himself thought of his factors in the way that we tend to. We think of the Mendelian factors as like atoms, atoms of heredity, countable somethings like balls, in an urn. But there's no evidence at all that Mendel thought about his factors that way. Indeed, everything he writes is consistent with the possibility that he thought of yellow making factor and green making factor as like immiscible fluids, like oil and water. You can bring oil and water together temporarily, but only temporarily. When Mendel writes about the characters from the two parents coming together in the hybrid in union, he writes about them as unstable. It's an unstable union. That's why when gametes are produced, it's like the uh, release of pressure. So again, the paper is not at all the one that we think we know from our textbooks. So let me spell out a few interim take-homes. The first, to put it in a slogan, is that Mendel was no Mendelian. This shouldn't shock anyone, right? Marx was no Marxist. Mendel was no Mendelian. You should, however, take some pride in this phrase because it's a Leeds phrase. Uh, it was in a famous publication by Robert Olby, who taught the history of science at Leeds for many years, uh, though the, the phrase was suggested to him by his Leeds colleague, my colleague, Jonathan Hodge. And it remains an important slogan. Mendel was no Mendelian. He belonged to his time. Second take home. The reason that Mendel concentrated at the start on uniform binary characters, yellowness, greenness, roundedness, wrinkledness, purpleness, whiteness, 
which are caused by nothing but material inside pollen and egg cells, was because he was interested in tracking the fate of hybrid characters. Mendel's choices make sense. In fact, they're brilliant in the light of Mendel's aims. By contrast, those same choices construed as starting points for understanding inheritance have been and remain very problematic. So that's worth bearing in mind, right? My, my, my book, although, uh, as I said, the chapter about Mendel is, is rightly in awe of Mendel, uh, is not a book from which Mendelism comes out very good. Uh, but none of that is meant to be critical of Mendel himself. Mendel was brilliant, but his interests were not the ones that our textbooks ascribe to him. And so we need to be aware of standard timelines, which start with Mendel and then take us through to, to CRISPR. Uh, in this timeline, it's even worse because the timeline literally is a bit of DNA being unwound. Nevertheless, the timeline does some work for me because I now want to take you in the talk from the mid 1860s when Mendel did his work and published his paper through to the beginning of the 20th century, 1900, the year when Mendel's paper suddenly becomes a talking point, first in European botany and then more widely. The rediscovery, as it's called almost from the start of Mendel's work. The, the actual rediscovery of the paper is the work of, of three European botanists, uh, Carl Korens, Hugo de Vries, and Eric Chermach. Uh, but the person who really runs with the notion that Mendel's paper changes everything is this man, William Bateson. Uh, Bateson, born in 1861, he studied zoology in the 1880s at Cambridge in the College St. John's where his father was the master. So not a bad start as those things go. Uh, throughout the 1890s, he developed brilliant work, uh, largely in criticism of the mainstream Darwinian thinking around him. Bateson emphasizing that in his view, new species come into being not gradually, uh, but suddenly by whole steps. And uh, when Bateson encountered Mendel's paper, initially in a paper of De Vries, but very quickly reading the paper himself, he was enormously impressed. And between 1900 and 1904, he moves rapidly and brilliantly to build a research program out of Mendel's paper. Uh, he intellectually, but also socially at Cambridge, he recruits a number of really exceptional young people to the cause. So that by 1904, the summer of 1904, when he steps up to give his own uh, lecture, as president of the zoological section of the British Association, which is meeting in Cambridge that summer. Uh, he has a lot to say, but he's also very aware of how important it is to press the social importance of this new science. And he does that very cunningly by playing off something that was on a lot of people's minds that summer, which was a report that came out of the afterwash of the Boer War. So throughout these early years of Bateson building the Mendelian program, uh, Britain politically was involved in a war that we don't hear very much about because it didn't go well for the British Empire. Uh, it was a war in which, as the Brits saw it, a relatively small number of South African farmers gave the British Empire a bloody nose. Uh, eventually, the British Empire won, uh, but they had to fight dirty. And there was a significant loss in terms of men, materiel, but also moral standing. And out of the, the debate afterwards about why Britain had done so badly in this war, uh, came the concern that physically Britain was degenerating. Uh, people saw this when they recruited in the northern industrial cities, the physically unprepossessing males who showed up for military duty. The concern was that British civilization was undermining itself. That's why they had done so badly. And so uh, an intergovernmental commission was established to investigate. Uh, and throughout 1903 into 1904, they sat collecting expert testimony. And throughout the summer of 1904, they delivered their results. And their results were very reassuring. It wasn't the case that 
biologically, Britain was degenerating physically. Rather, the decline that had made itself visible at the recruiting offices was down to poor education, down to poor sanitation, generally down to environmental ills, which could be remedied. And within a few generations of better education, better sanitation, better public health, better provision uh, of the public welfare, Britain would be back in fighting form. So what does Bateson say at the end of his tour of the achievements of the new Mendelism that had been underway at Cambridge? He ends with the following. He says, some of you will be wondering about the social importance of this new science that I've been telling you about. It's plainly going to be very important for agriculture. But what about beyond agriculture? Here's what Bateson has to say. If, as is usual, the philanthropist is seeking for some external application by which to ameliorate, to improve the course of descent, knowledge of heredity cannot help me. We have no experience of any means by which transmission may be made to deviate from its course, nor from the moment of fertilization from teaching or hygiene or exhortation, pick out the particles of evil in that zygote or put in one particle of good. Education, sanitation, and the rest are but the giving or withholding of opportunity. Though in the matter of heredity, every other conclusion has been questioned, I rejoice that in this we are all agreed. So the zygote is father of the man, according to William Bateson. The tradition that we're all familiar with these days of geneticists popping up from time to time to tell us that we can't handle their truths, their truths being that we're born, not made, that starts early. And it starts with William Bates. And as I show in the book, it's picked up on by his acolytes at Cambridge, notably Reginald Pennett uh, and Robert Locke. This was a theme that Bateson would periodically hammer throughout the rest of his career. Uh, he gave a lecture to soldiers during the First World War, uh, and after which a Scottish soldier came up to him and said, what you're telling us amounts to scientific Calvinism, Calvinism being the most fatalistic theology there ever was. To which Bateson replied, yeah, that's about right. He actually thought about publishing a volume of his popular essays under the title Scientific Calvinism. And it's no accident, I suggest, that Mendelism and eugenics marched arm in arm in the two countries, the United States and Nazi Germany, where eugenics went furthest and most distressingly. Uh, in the 1920s in the United States, Mendelian arguments were used in the testimony that persuaded the US Supreme Court to legalize the uh, coerced sterilization of people in institutions for, as they called it, the feeble-minded. Uh, ultimately, about 60,000 Americans were sterilized. It was also used in defending the arguments for harsher immigration restrictions against the parts of the world where bad hereditary stock, as some Americans saw it at that time, was coming in. Um, throughout the 1920s, German eugenicists looked on in envy at what was happening in the United States, but with the ascension of Hitler, uh, in 1933, they had their moment. And once again, as documented um, in a brilliant book by our Burdetsky lecturer uh, uh, earlier this year, Amir Teicher, called Social Darwinism, Mendelian concepts and language show up over and over and over again. Plays are put on throughout Germany to instruct people in the basics of Mendelian genetics so that they'll be aware of their responsibilities to the Volk be aware of the fact that someone who looks normal might actually be harboring recessive factors, as indeed they might be, so that their offspring could turn out to be uh, suffering from hereditary blindness or hereditary uh, epilepsy or hereditary Jewishness. That was something Hitler worried about. In, in Germany, they actually had a term, which we don't have in English, to talk about the return of a recessive character. Something would mendel out greenness would mendel out, right? wrinkledness would mendel out, Jewishness would mendel out. We have transcriptions of Hitler's table talk in which he worried about 
that idea that Mendelism means that uh, factors are persistently, stubbornly remaining inside the germline, only becoming visible when they meet their partner. That's the one side of my battle over Mendel. The other side was represented most brilliantly by this man, Walter Frank Raphael Weldon. Uh, Weldon was uh, educated alongside Bateson, he's a little older than Bateson, uh, at Cambridge at the same moment, but unlike Bateson, uh, took Darwinism to be his guiding light biologically. And he was best known through the 1890s for work that he did uh, showing how to capture Darwinian natural selection in the act. Brilliant statistical and experimental work that he did with shore crabs. After the buzz around Mendel's paper began to grow, Weldon took an interest, but he quickly found that there were some problems. And in February 1902, he published a critique. So this is not even two years after the rediscovery of Mendel's paper. Uh, and in Weldon's critique, he includes uh, this image, which is uh, the, the part of which is on the, the cover of my book. We're looking here at peas, but unlike Mendel's peas, they don't come in either yellow or green varieties. If you have a look in box number one there at the top, you see peas that are really green. And then over the side, box number six, peas that are really yellow, but in between peas that fall on a color spectrum, on a range from greenness through to greeny yellow, through to yellowy green onto yellow. In other words, if you're not already committed to categorizing peas using Mendel's categories, you don't see what he prepares you to see. You don't see either yellowness or greenness, you see a spectrum. Now, Mendel, uh, Weldon's point here was not that it's impossible ever to get peas that conform to something like Mendel's pattern. Rather, his point was that Mendel's pattern is a special case. It's what you get when you strip out all of the variability that would otherwise obtain internally and externally. Um, I find a good way into Weldon's perspective is via an old joke, which is beloved of philosophers of science. It goes like this, it's nighttime, guy's walking down the street and sees another guy down on the ground looking around. First guy says, what are you doing? Second guy says, I dropped my keys on the other side of the street. First guy says, well, why are you looking for them over here? The second guy says, because the light's better. In, in Weldon's view, a Mendelian experiment with all of that purifying, all of that control is looking where the light is good. And that's not uninstructive sometimes, but it's not necessarily where the key lies. So Weldon publishes this critique in February, 1902. Bateson is already committed to reshaping the whole of biology and society in the light of Mendel's paper. And so there is a ferocious debate between these two. Uh, and I quote a lot of correspondence in which you get to see just how bitter this became, front of stage and backstage. So we've seen how Bateson thinks you ought to begin the study of inheritance because it's how we start our study of inheritance, right? With Mendel and his peas. What did Weldon think a good beginning looked like? Well, we know because Weldon later that year in the autumn in Belfast at a meeting of the British Association for the Advancement of Science gave a talk to a general audience like the one I'm giving tonight under the title Inheritance. And very early on, he introduces his audience to the water flea Daphne. And he discusses an experimental study of growth of the spine in the water flea. And what he tells his audience is that is if you raise Daphne in overcrowded water, you'll produce spineless Daphne generation after generation, right? Because uh, as the water gets crowded, it becomes polluted with their waste products and that affects spine growth. So eventually you get Daphne that have no spines. But he says, if you remove one of these spineless individuals to pure water, its descendants will grow up to have a long spine. Now, this is an electron inheritance. 
This is the first thing Weldon wants you to think about. Now, here's what he says. Now, clearly the condition of the spine is not exclusively acquired and it is not exclusively inherited. It belongs to both categories. A daphnia of certain ancestry growing in a solution of certain chemical composition has a spine of certain length, of a certain length. You cannot assert that either factor is more essential than the other. For if the daphnia remain the same, you can change the result by changing the solution. While if the solution remain the same, you can, within considerable limits, change the result by changing the daphnia. We see here, says Weldon, in 1902, the complex way in which the characters of an organism are determined by the interaction of the two sets of factors, the environmental and the ancestral. For Weldon, this is absolutely basic. He thinks that if the best biological science of his day has established anything of importance, it's this. You always have to be thinking about these two in interaction when you're looking at a mature character. To put it in a slogan, context matters. That's the first lesson one needs to take in in understanding inheritance from Weldon's point of view. And that context matters message was captured several years later, 1909. So this is 1902. We've been looking at Weldon dies in 1906. Three years later, a German investigator named Volterek, not citing Weldon, but also using Daphne did a study in which he produced the first of these graphs, which are called norm of reaction graphs. So we've got here not spine length on the y-axis, but head length. And on the x-axis, you get quantity of nutrients in the solution, going from poor to middling to, to rich. And we get there A, B, C, three different Daphnia variants. And what we see is that each variant responds distinctively to the particular environment that it's in. So that, as, as Weldon said, if we want a daphnia of a certain head length, let's say head length 40, we can either change the daphnia or change the solution. It depends on both. And when you look at a diagram like that, you're reminded in a flash of the fact that it's these two in interaction, ancestry and environment. By contrast, we're never invited to think about this, but when uh, you're in invited to organize your own knowledge of inheritance around patterns like this, you're doing it around patterns in which the environment plays no role at all. All you need to do to understand the three to one pattern is to follow the dance of these alleles, the genetically called it, the gene variants. It's as if we've taken a slice from one bit of the environment that a normative reaction diagram would be concerned with and regard that as what we want. And there are interesting upshots. When, you're, when you look at a Mendelian pattern and you look at the one in the three to one, the green key in that second hybrid generation, the, the green peas, you're never invited to think, might there actually be some yellow making factor in there? That can't happen on Mendel's way of analyzing the problem. You can only get a green seeded pea if green making factor met green making factor. Weldon wondered empirically whether that was actually true. And to give you some sympathy from his point of view, you might consider a study from our own day, a study into centenarians. So people who lived over 100, the question came up, might they have some sort of gene for longevity? It's not a bad question. They searched and they didn't find it. What they did find was that a lot of the people in their study ought to have been killed off a long time ago by the genes they carried in their genomes, according to textbooks. So you can have genes for any number of conditions, and yet you would never know, except upon genomic analysis. That's the kind of concern that, that Weldon had, that you might harbor what the Mendelian would tell you are uh, uh, chromosomal variants in his case, which would absolutely make for a certain character. In Weldon's view, you can't just read off the visible character from 
what's inside. You have to also investigate conflict. So uh, the lecture in Belfast was in 1902. From 1902 to 1906, these two are at it, hammer and tongs. By the end, by uh, early 1906, Weldon was well on his way to writing, finishing a book in which he set out his alternative perspective, a perspective on the science of inheritance in which Mendelian patterns took their place, not as the grand generalization around which to hang everything else, but as a special case, an interesting special case, but a special case as what you get when you strip out all of that variability that ordinarily obtains. But he didn't finish that book. In the spring of 1906, he came down with a case of pneumonia, which turned out to be fatal. And at the age of 46, he died with his major work unfinished and unpublished. And it's lain ever since in the archive in London. What happened thereafter? Well, we know what happened because our textbooks record that. Bateson and his Mendelians went on to build the science of inheritance that we're familiar with. And the results for the organization of the knowledge of inheritance scientifically is one in which Mendelian patterns are at the center and the kinds of patterns that Weldon thought most instructive are at the periphery. They're marginalized. They're not forgotten about. No one's in denial about them, about all of the variability that comes about because of the multifactorial nature of what brings about visible characters. Not forgotten about, not ignored, but marginalized. It's not what you teach when you walk into a classroom on day one. What we teach is about Mendel's peers. And I think it's we get an insight into what it's like to grow up even now in a culture in which your knowledge is thus organized. Uh, from a testimonial that a geneticist published last year. Last year was a big birthday party for Mendel. It was his 200th birthday. And so the geneticist showed him a lot of love. Um, one of them was a Dublin-based geneticist, Aoife McLissett. Uh, and in her testimonial, she sang the praises of genetics. And this is a quotation. I'll fill in the blanks in a moment. She says, Genetics is incredibly complex. And I've only taken that out there because I didn't have room on the slide. She says, it's incredibly, fantastically, wonderfully, bewilderingly complex. We now know that most traits, physical, biochemical, behavioral, are influenced by many different genetic variants, individually of small effect, acting in combination with the environment and stochastic processes, so randomness, uh, during development. Even identical twins who share all their genes are not actually identical. And she goes on from there to inventory all of the problems that can arise from students picking up from their teaching the idea that heredity is destiny, that genes are these little string pullers. She's aware of all of them. And yet, she says, I could not imagine trying to teach genetics without starting with Mendel. That's what it's like to grow up in that kind of an intellectual culture. Unlike her, I could imagine trying to teach genetics without starting with Mendel. And that's because as a historian, I've been hanging out with someone who didn't have to unthink Mendelism in the ways that we find it pretty much impossible to do. That's what you get by spending some time with someone like Weldon. And so at a certain point, and I now come to the, the final part of the talk, uh, in my own investigations and researching all of this, I asked myself, well, what would have happened if Weldon had lived long enough to finish that book? That book in which environment and all the variability that it brings about wasn't just marginalized, but made central. What difference would it have made? And I quickly realized that I couldn't actually go back and bring about that change to see what would have happened. But maybe I could imagine what a textbook would look like if it came out of this alternative past, this past that never happened, in which Weldon lived long enough to write that book, what would a genetics textbook look like now if it came out of that Weldonian past? Well, I figured that it wouldn't start kids off with Mendel and his peas and then proceed to complicate them. Right? You would begin them off instead with something much more representative of 
the role that genes play in the kind of characters that matter to them, like the role that genes play in the condition of a heart. Now that's interesting because it's plainly going to be multifactorial. There's going to be genes, but also diet and stress levels and class. Uh, oh, and, and furthermore, it's going to change in the course of an individual's lifetime. It's gonna matter whether they're male or female, what race they belong to. So that you would never come away from that thinking that there was some gene for heart disease or whatever you would call a gene for heart disease would have to be something you'd have to heavily qualify. So let's suppose we started them off with that and that in, in teaching them about genetics, we hammered home at every opportunity that genes are interacting all the time with other genes and with the environment. That's not like a luxury item that they might meet one day and forget. So that when years later, when they think about genetics, what they remember is dominance and recessiveness. Instead, what these students are set to remember is that everything's interacting with everything else almost all the time, and that makes for huge variability. So that when they meet Mendel's patterns, they meet them not as the grand generalization, but as a special case. It's interesting precisely because it's unlike what happens generally. So let's suppose that you could teach this Weldonian genetics course, and, and the students didn't just run screaming from the first lecture because it was complicated, but instead they found it interesting and they stayed the course. What would those students be like at the end? In particular, might they be less deterministic in their attitudes to genes than students coming out of a start with Mendel's Peace course? Well, to my amazement here at Leeds, we got the experiment going. Uh, along with my colleague, Jenny Lewis, uh, who was then based in education, and Annie Jameson, who worked with me in history and philosophy of science at Leeds, we ran the experiment. Uh, we wrote, largely Annie wrote, uh, oh, this Weldonian curriculum that I was describing to you. We recruited students onto it. Uh, and what we found was pretty interesting. Uh, there's Annie there. Uh, we found that students who took Genetics 101 at Leeds uh, were as deterministic about genes at the end of teaching on average as they were at the start. So you wanna keep your eye on the dotted yellow line there. That's the, that's the after data. So no shift, because we, we assess them before and after teaching in their attitudes to the idea that heredity is destined. By contrast, the students who took our experimental Weldonian course were on average less deterministic about genes at the end of teaching than they were at the start. In other words, the more that our students learned about genetics, the less confident they became that you could read off visible character from genotype. And in the 21st century, that's a win. That's what you should conclude from all of the complexity that we've unpacked from our genomes, from our epigenomes, from our microbiomes and interaction of all of that. And so it seems like uh, and a, a, a good way potentially to ensure that students come out of a genetics education without inappropriate attitudes to the causal powers of genes is to go back to this history that never was, this Waldonian past that might have been. And in effect, what, we've, what we managed to do in that experiment in Leeds about 10 years ago was to press the reset button and to reverse what's central and what's peripheral. So rather than Mendelian patterns being at the center of knowledge about inheritance and variability and environmental interaction being off on the margins, we reversed all of it, which was itself, I think, an interesting thing to do. And it's been very rewarding to see how much excitement there's been in the community of people who teach genetics um, about the work that we've done. And that's despite the age old wisdom, which tells you that when you're teaching, you've got to keep things simple. Right, so you're all familiar with this from your science educations. You'll learn about atoms and atoms look like little solar systems, right? With the nucleus like the sun and then there's the electrons around it. And then the next year you're told, remember that stuff I taught you last year? Well, it's not quite that. And so that your, your whole science education is a series of being disabused of, of what you were taught last year. Well, 
whatever the wisdom of that way of teaching, I'm not all sure that's actually that wise, but whatever the wisdom of that way of teaching science subjects in general, there's a case for thinking that with genetics, it's different. Because with genetics, it's personal. And this is beautifully put by the psychologist Stephen Heine in his book, DNA is Not Destiny, in a passage in which he was actually reflecting on the experiments that we did here at Leeds. Here's what he says. There's a key difference between the complexities of the atom and the complexities of our genomes. We don't make life decisions on the basis of our understanding about how subatomic particles operate. Incorrectly believing that the atom is akin to a miniature solar system has no consequences in our daily lives. In stark contrast, incorrectly believing that genes are like switches, this to that, leads us to become fatalistic and can result in increased sexism, racism, and irrational fears about our future disease risk. When it comes to our genomes, I submit that it's far better to highlight the difficulty in understanding the complex machinery of genetics than it is to give people a false sense of understanding that leads them to make potentially costly decisions in their lives. On the point about fatalism that he makes here, recall the study I told you about, about those centenarians. And imagine if they had been told in their 40s or 50s or 60s that according to DNA analysis, they were going to die. By living to over 100 without that analysis, they never had to suffer the psychological consequences of the kind of fatalism that that kind of a diagnosis would have brought about. But that's the temptation of interpreting genetic results without the kind of Weldonian hinterland intellectually that I've been talking about, which would enable someone to pose skeptical probing questions about exactly what genetic backgrounds and environments have those genes been assessed for, because you're always going to find that it's limited. You need to find that out in order to assess in your own case. So fatalism is a concern. So are those other isms mentioned in that passage. Uh, my uh, collaborator of mine, Brian Donovan, did an important study in the United States with middle school students in which he looked at uh, a familiar pedagogic move that's made uh, after students are introduced to Mendel's peas. Uh, they're then inevitably wondering, but does this apply to things beyond peas? And the answer is yes. Uh, and the standard move is then to turn to human diseases, which uh, resemble Mendelian inheritance patterns in their inheritance. And the standard go-to examples are uh, cystic fibrosis in people of white European ancestry, Tay-Sachs disease in people of Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry, and sickle cell disease in people of Black African ancestry. And for purposes of learning the, the elementary Mendelian patterns and reasoning that I, I introduced you to, those examples are brilliant because the same points get stamped in, but now with these different examples. That's the good news. What's the bad news? Well, Brian investigated, Brian Donovan. And what he found was that after those lessons, students came away with an exaggerated notion of the homogeneity of the human races. They came away with exaggerated pessimism about the ability of closing gaps in educational attainment. They even came away less willing to socialize across racial lines. Um, as a teacher involved in the study commented afterwards, it was as if the students came away from the lesson convinced that different kinds of people are different kinds of animals. So there's a lot at stake in getting this right. Uh, and uh, Brian and I, along with Michelle Smith, uh, have been collaborating for several years now on a large scale NSF funded study in which we're trying to take the work done at Leeds uh, and make it vastly more rigorous uh, in looking at the effects cognitively on students of teaching genetics in different ways, but also trying to probe the underlying psychological mechanisms. And this is tricky work, but it's, it's, it's I think worth, worth trying uh, to look at the possible relations between categorical thinking, thinking in terms of yellowness, greenness, Roundedness, wrinkledness, Jewish, black, stereotyping, the thought that being a certain kind of person brings with it certain kinds of properties. And what psychologists call the difference between a growth mindset and a fixed mindset. Uh, a fixed mindset being a mindset in which someone thinks 
I can't change, you can't change, the world can't change, things just are the way they are. A growth mindset being one in which, on the contrary, the thought is that I can change, you can change, we can change, things can change. So looking at the interrelations between all of those, and how teaching genetics in a more Weldonian versus a Mendelian way might impact students is, as I say, work for the present. But I think it's, it's important work. And I want to finish by drawing your attention to a, a dual meaning in the, the title of the book, Disputed Inheritance. So plainly, it's about a dispute over inheritance in the early 20th century, this battle over Mendel. Uh, but it's also toward the end of the book, uh, aiming to help readers become more thoughtful about their scientific inheritances. Right? All of the hand-me-down science, including hand-me-down ways of teaching science that, that we inherit, which we're never invited to be critical about. But it might be that being more thoughtful about this debate in the early 20th century over Mendel's work can help us push back a little bit against some of the hand-me-down expectations, the Punnett Square organized way in which genetics is taught. And, and I want to finish because it, it is a book talk. And traditionally, a book talk, people read a little bit from the book um, by, by reading from the very uh, last paragraph of the conclusion. It's a con closing call to arm. Uh, here's the start, and I'll read out the rest. Like our biological inheritances on a Weldonian view, our scientific inheritances are ours to mold, not in any way we please, but in more ways than we might have guessed before taking a closer look at the scope for alternative possibilities. Although they are only beginning, classroom experiments in weldonizing introductory genetics suggest that our biology teachers are not doomed to produce students whose first thoughts about genes are of dominance, recessiveness, and Punnett squares, rather than context, variability, and norm of reaction graphs, who come away from lessons on the genetics of disease convinced that people of different races are, in essence, different kinds of animals. Students educated to be less liable to deterministic thinking about genes will be better equipped in later life to ask probing questions when confronted not only with genetics invoking social prejudice, but as they increasingly will be, with complex genetic information and powerful genetic technologies. And if, as part of classroom instruction in genetics, these students learn a little of its history, I hope its basics are presented not as emerging fully formed from Mendel's forehead, but as forged in the crucible of an early 20th century debate about his experiments, a debate so fierce that its proponents felt themselves to be in battle. A biology education along those lines belongs to a future worth fighting for. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much. Wonderful talk. Uh, I, I know we're going to be inundated with questions here, uh, not just from here, but also from uh, the people on Zoom. So uh, I've never I've never um, shared a question session with uh, live on Zoom, but we'll, we'll do our best. Uh, I think uh, I, I think I would like to uh, when you start talking, I'll try try and unmute everybody on Zoom, and we'll, we'll see how we go with that. Okay. But um, that was a wonderful talk. Uh, can't wait to uh, get my copy of the book. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I mean, <clears throat> it's really fascinating. Uh, I mean, I, I'm a, um, I, I'm cursed to a weird sort of molecular biologist, and we tend to view genes as uh, not just units of heredity, but chemical units. Uh, and, and it's taking us to the wars, the, the, you know, the chemical nature of this. Uh, and you, you've been talking about something that is indirectly related to that, but at a much, uh, at a much higher level. And, and I, I actually wonder, in a way, if <clears throat> the, you know, what came after Mendel and, and Weldon was really an intense study of bacterial uh, genetics and bacteriophage uh, genetics, where there is only one copy <laughs> in simpler genomes. Uh, and, and, you know, this gave us the sort of one gene, one enzyme uh, 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 hypothesis of Lederberg and, and, and so on from studying uh, very simple organisms, because even your, your Daphne is a, a very complex organism. Yes. Uh, you, you know, as complex as, as the uh, gene. Uh, but uh, 
Well, um, and one of the things that I find so uh, instructive about uh, knowing more about how involved Weldon was in these debates at this time is that with Weldon, in the early 20th century, you have someone who already took it for granted that chromosomes were in cellular terms the bearers yeah. of inheritance. Yeah. It's, it's, it's an interesting quirk of the history of biology that one of the few people who questioned that was William Bates. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but Weldon, the opponent of Mendelism, had no problem at all with chromosomes. Mm -hmm. uh, neither did Weldon have any problem with Darwinism. So uh, he helps us think about what might have happened had the movers and shakers in the science of inheritance at the very start of the 20th century been people who took chromosomes as seriously as he took them. Uh, because one way of looking at the history of molecular biology, uh, the, the, the biology that, that you and Kirsten work in, is that it's, it's the science of inheritance that grows from taking chromosomes seriously. Uh, both uh, the, what's inside chromosomes and their causal effects on bodies. Uh, on the whole, um, with bacterial genetics, it's a little bit different, but, but on the whole, that is not a science that depended on crossbreeding. That, that, that's a very important point, that not one I emphasized in the lecture, but an important one for the book. If you recall, at the very start of the lecture, I introduced you to the spider goats of Utah, and I suggested that However, the debate over Mendel went in the early 20th century. We would now have spider goats, CRISPR, uh, pretty much the whole array of techniques and technologies uh, that enable us at a molecular level to study and to intervene uh, on chromosomes. Uh, and, and in saying that, I'm gesturing toward a part of the analysis of the book in which I emphasize how much our molecular understanding and biochemical understanding of genes owes uh, almost nothing to distinctively Mendelian knowledge, and instead owes its origins to X-ray crystallography, a lead science, uh, to nucleic acid chemistry. Right? In the case of Watson and Crick, you know, what, what led them to the double helix model? Uh, it wasn't crossing of organisms, right? Uh, it's, it's, it's the drawing on of resources which came along afterward. Uh, and which are largely independent of Mendelian knowledge. Um, so, so I think it's 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 important to take seriously just how uh, how intellectually independent all of that is from from Mendelian knowledge. Yes, yes. I mean, <clears throat> you know, I, I I teach in this area, and mm -hmm. a, a lot of students feel that there's not necessary really to understand all of that stuff. Uh, you, you know, you've got to understand the fact that all of the uh, the, the basic science and the applications and, and things like that. And it's kind of difficult. I mean, unless they're doing uh, a, a degree in proper genetics, mm -hmm. uh, not my version of it, <laughs> uh, it's important to, to know all of that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Now, okay, so I've had my two cents there. How about questions from the audience? Kirsten is first. Question very strong there. Yes, I want. I was very quickly to make the pronouncement that scientists and the historians and philosophers of science are potentially very few one of the people. <laughs> well, I think tonight you have immediately put into the sledgehammer a killer from a complicated epidemiology there, and it's a big word, and thank you, and um, just hold it. Um, Eric Classical there in 2007, I have pronounced the last show wrong. But the thing you thought there, and the last thing that was available, and that was the well in this point that mm. what some of the people that went down to the level of biology was just to see what happened at the level of that blood cancer treatment treatment Well, the world is top of my head now. Mm-hmm. 
<laughs> you know, it, it's it's a great question, and it's not one that that I've that I've thought about um, or, or investigated by by happenstance. Um, having been alerted to this experiment and Weldon's ways of, of thinking about it, it wasn't. It was actually a student of his named Ernest Warren, who did the experiment in, in his lab. Uh, but Warren's work is now well cited, I gather, in the toxicology. Uh, and so it, 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 did, it did go on to have a, a kind of a life. Uh, Daphnia, meanwhile, and perhaps there'll be people here who know more about this than I do, or people online who know more about it than I do. Daphnia has a life in the biology class. Uh, it's, it's used when teaching about the heartbeat. So, so Daphnia, um, Daphnia has an interesting life within um, pedagogic biology uh, and, and to a certain extent research biology. But, but your, your question though, you know, were the Volterra style or Warren style experiments studied at the molecular level in the way that Mendel's P-traits have been fully molecularized? What an interesting question. Um, I, I'll, I'll look into that. Or perhaps if people online or people here in the room know, I'd be delighted to know. But yes. Um, but apropos of your first remark, on the one hand, I really appreciate it. So you might remember Kirsten said, His scientists need historians of science. Uh, we, we bring something important. Uh, on the one hand, I, I want to, of course, I, I think that's wonderful to hear. On the other hand, I don't, I, I genuinely don't think that, as it were, um, being a scientist disqualifies someone uh, from being able to do seriously good history of science work. Uh, not everything that Stephen Jay Gould wrote was perfect. Uh, but Gould at his best was kind of incredible. And I think that's the kind of scientist that I'd love to see other scientists want to be like. Uh, Oliver Sacks was another example of, of, a, of someone who found in the past, explored non-anachronistically, you know, not trying to look for people who either agreed with you or disagree with you, but looking to the past as a source of stimulus or in different ways of thinking, ways of thinking which have been lost. Uh, there, are, there have been good examples of scientists like that. Uh, I wish there were more of them, uh, but, um, but I, I, I still hold on to the possibility that there can be. Uh, and I, and I, I, to my mind, that's immensely exciting. And someone who is scientifically active is also historically curious. Uh, so they're, they're out there. Yeah. Yeah. It's an excellent question. So for, for sure, yeah, for, for those online, the question was was about the status of the controlled experiment in in our scientific culture. And and you know, you the 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 question uh, brought out the ways in which my talk brought out the limitations in an excessive attention to control, that it, it can ultimately be misleading. Uh, and actually, I, I quote Weldon in the book, saying that the experiments can be very instructive, but you have to guard against the possibility that the thing you've screened out is actually the thing on which everything depends. <laughs> uh, and, and so um, the question was, what, what might we do about that? And, and I, think it's, it, I think you do touch a nerve uh, because uh, I've been collaborating in small ways with with, here in Leeds with members of the, the Leeds Center for Disease Modeling. And this is something on their minds that the, the demand for replicability uh, means that you, you end up uh, sidelining investigations which could be really illuminating uh, precisely because they represent 
kind of one-off exceptions from the rule you were expecting. Uh, but for practical reasons of needing to needing to generate publications and those publications needing to generate grants and so on, there's there's an immense pressure on the replicable result. Uh, and that ends up marginalizing uh, a lot of uh, pushing to the periphery what might otherwise be investigated and, and instructive. And so we actually have a grant application in right now, which uh, attempts to hybridize the work they're doing with the work that I'm doing, precisely to help open this up. And in some ways, it's a test balloon to see whether a talk about interdisciplinarity and what it, what it can do for, for opening disciplines up from their accustomed grooves, uh, whether that's just talk or whether they really mean it. So I'll get back to you on that, waiting to hear now. But, but I think it's, it's an important point. And, and it speaks both to, to intellectual limitations in the way that science, garden variety science gets done, uh, and to problems in the wider culture around that. Uh, and if I can maybe finish the comment with, with this thought, that um, sometimes one of the responses I get to the teaching experiment is to say, well, that's all well and good, but there are so many sources of pressure on determinism in our culture, you know, what difference could it make making a change in this one area? Uh, but I, I incline not just to optimism, but to being empirical about this. Well, let's try to do something different. It may be that nothing comes of it and that ultimately those students will be shunted back into the kind of heredity as destiny thinking that everyone's shunted towards, but maybe not. Uh, you know, that, and, and likewise, maybe we can make a change in one laboratory culture in a way that emboldens some investigators to go places they wouldn't have gone otherwise. Uh, yeah, so I think it's I think it's important in the best scientific spirit to you know to be empirical about these things. Uh, and and if history can be a stimulus to new ways of being empirical about it, all the better. Right. Hmm. Sure. So, so the the, the question um, began with uh, an observation about how the the increasing appreciation for the, the role of epigenetics in phenotypes and how how organisms come out makes. Uh, even more conspicuous this this point that I was making about how context matters uh, that that uh, one and the same uh, sequence of A's and T's and G's and C's can have different effects on a body depending on the methyl groups uh, and other epigenetic uh, biochemical overlays uh, and then that then led to a question about simplicity and the, the hunger for the one overarching uh, theory, uh, when in fact there should be lots of things in play for to capture the complexity of the world. And, and I, um, I, don't, I think it's a very important observation. I don't myself have, have settled thoughts on that. Um, I do, however, notice the difference between, let's say, Darwinian natural selection as a, as a principle um, and Mendelian principles, because uh, you know someone has said to me, "Oh, well, show me Weldon's principles of heredity," uh, as in like a one-to-one -one mapping with Mendel's principles of heredity. And it was a good question, but it led me to the thought that well, uh, the the desire for this mathematized statement is itself part of the problem. If you if you think about Darwin's theory of evolution, which no one in this room has any trouble understanding, 
it's a theory in which context matters in a big way. Everyone is able to understand the notion that a particular trait may be adaptive in one context and not in another. So we're actually familiar. We have a number of, I think, master theories in biology, which invite in a positive way, this kind of contextual thinking. And in some ways, the weird outlier is Mendelian genetics. Uh, I meant to say that um, at the end of those of you uh, who are online, if this interests you, you can write to me and I'll, I'll be glad to email it to you. But those of you who are in the room, um, I've brought printouts of uh, Q and A that I've done on the book with a genetics journal called Trends in Genetics, which should come out in the next few weeks. Uh, uh, but uh, I, I mention it because um, in, in that q and I, I make you know, just these points. And I, I quote a biology teacher who reflects on his 40 years of teaching genetics as now having heavily misled his students. Um, and, and what he says is that whenever it was time to teach genetics, it felt like he was leaving biology and teaching mathematical logic. And so my remark in my q and is to say, imagine if teaching genetics felt like biology. <laughs> Um, and if you if if you can imagine that you're you're getting along the lines of what a Weldonian perspective on genetics would would look like. Um, um, I I try to unmute. Uh, I'm here. Um, I try to unmute everybody on Zoom, um, but I, I I have been looking at the chat questions. They've mainly been very positive about the the lecture, Greg. But if if anybody uh, on Zoom would like just to. Uh, unmute themselves and ask a question. Uh, I'd be very grateful, actually. Uh, anybody on Zoom want to, to, to say anything? Okay. <laughs> uh, well, I, I, I think we're. I think we are probably getting getting on a bit. But it's such a fascinating topic. That, uh, May I make one final remark? Yes, of course. Um, please. Well, I, first, I just want to thank you all so much for, for your attention and for your great questions. Uh, I do have some copies of the book, uh, which, which are for sale, uh, if, you, if you want to buy them. Uh, so so uh, just come up. And it's also available on Amazon, anywhere where, where you like to buy books. But, but, I, and, 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 but for free, I've also got to say copies of, of that Q&A, uh, uh, which I think is, is a, itself a, a quite accessible way into the book as a whole. No doubt you could let us have a digital file. Sure. It would be a pleasure. Find copies, absolutely. <laughs> okay. Um, Greg, uh, thank you so much for your talk. Uh, it's given lots of uh, maybe a, a different perspective to kindle uh, our, our, our lectures from your <laughs> uh, and uh, let us be, be, be there. So it's a fascinating story. So it's a fantastic story. And I'm especially with the people. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, on that. going to be quite a different sort of priestly lecture with uh, a scientist from here in, in Leeds talking about the um, extraordinary telescope that's out there now. What's it called? The James 
uh, Webb telescope, that's right. But we're also going to have a perspective on that from possibly from the Minister of Mill Hill Chapel. So talking about the science of the telescope and what it's finding, and also um, thinking about the implications of that for how we see ourselves here on Earth. So I think that might be the most important one. On the 28th of November, we'll have Danny Altman talking about the ongoing uh, study on the ongoing problem of long COVID, if he's got time, because he's obviously incredibly busy down at Imperial doing this. And then on the 7th of December, Thursday, the 7th of December, we've got the AGM and dinner. And uh, those of you who've recently signed up for the society, I hope might consider coming along. It's, uh, it's live as an event to book now online. And uh, we hope to welcome you to a rather grand venue at uh, the Iconic uh, Hall and Castle Grove up in Headingley. Uh, so anyway, that's enough. Oh, and see you soon. Okay, thank, uh, thank you again, and uh, hope, hope you're only back here. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.